morning. Good morning, Calvary. How are we doing today? Good morning. It's great to see you. If you're out in the lobby area or in the foyer area, please make your way in as we worship together this morning. If you're watching online or on television as well, we welcome you. Beautiful day that the Lord has provided for us today. And again, it's great to have you with us this morning. Would you please stand this morning as we worship through music, worship our Savior, Jesus Christ.
Come on, we praise your name. In unity, we sing your praise, Father. Amen. You may be seated. You know, it says in the Word that one day, every tongue will bow, and every knee will bow, and every tongue will confess with one voice that Jesus Christ is Lord. Amen. Amen. It's, again, it's wonderful to have you. Thank you for coming and joining us this morning here at, uh, at Calvary. We've got just a couple of announcements for you to make sure that you uh, keep up to speed on what's happening. You got a connector as you came in. If uh, for some reason I, did, I don't mention all of the announcements, you can always look here throughout the rest of the week to make sure that you know what's going on. Okay, we've got a couple of announcements concerning our Nexus ministry, okay? Immediately following this service, we are going to have a parents' meeting right inside the church here. Again, this is for all parents of 6th uh, through 12th grade students who will be attending Nexus Student Ministries. So quick parent meeting today immediately following the service. So please plan on attending that, okay? Also for Nexus stu Student Ministries, all students, including incoming 6th graders, are invited to attend an end of the summer bash. This is going to be over at the uh, Walt and Denise Wood House. That's going to be Wednesday night, okay? Wednesday night, 6 to 9 p.m. So come in clothes that can get wet and soapy, okay? Thank you for that. Whoever wrote that, thank you, Nick. I think that was Nick. Thank you, Nick. That was good. And bring a towel or a change of clothes. Okay, their address is in the church directory. See Nick for more details. Nick, where are you? Right there you are, bud. Okay, good. Sounds like a great time. Extra clothes and a lot of soap. Sounds great. Tables of eight. It's good to be good. Tables of eight. Now, here's what they do with tables of eight. Basically, what this is is an opportunity for you to connect with more people that maybe you haven't had a chance to connect with yet here at Calvary, okay? And, of course, there's food involved. So, basically, what happens is, yeah, I know, no way, hard to believe. One person or one couple will host the event, and then the other six will come to their house, sit down, have a nice meal, get to know each other, um, and, uh, and just fellowship a bit and get to know new people. So, tables of eight, sign up. You can uh, find out more out in the uh, foyer area, but make sure you get signed up for the fall tables of eight. Speaking of the fall, the fall schedule is coming out. This is what it looks like. It begins September 15th, okay? So make sure that you uh, take a look at the fall schedule. Also, Awana starts September 11th with, yes, Awana, we're very excited for that, with registration night and a leaders meeting on the 4th. So a couple of different dates there. Awana starts on the 11th, registration night, and leaders meeting is on the 4th. And it uh, looks like that leaders meeting is at 6 o'clock. So Awana volunteers, please let Pastor Josh know that you are helping out ASAP. He needs to get a total on uh, who's going to be helping for Awana. So if you can help, we would certainly appreciate that. Sunday classes, as you can see up on the, uh, the uh, last slide, begin on September 15th at 8.45 a.m. Life group signups. Here we go for life groups. Uh, connection nights. This is a great opportunity, again, for you to get connected, dive into the word with uh, other folks here at Calvary. Uh, you can come in and meet leaders and get connected on September 20th at 6 o'clock. Root beer floats, yard games, and fellowship. So that's, again, on the 20th of September. And uh, finally, a couple of more announcements. Real quick, Rescued and Redeemed. Don't forget about this fantastic event, a Christ-centered nonprofit organization to combat sex trafficking and child exploitation. This is going to be on September 7th from 1 to 5 p.m. This is an amazing event. This is... The human trafficking and whatnot, it's happening right here. If, we, uh, if we're too naive to think that it's not happening here in the Eau Claire area, we've got another thing coming because it is happening. And this is an amazing event to, uh, to dive in and to help and to uh, make sure that we're aware of what's going on. So, again, please plan on attending this. I know that Sally Blues, uh, I'm not seeing her today, but she would be your contact there for more information on that event, okay? Finally, Hope Gospel Mission. We're going to be doing a little bit of a, of a remodel for their new facility. It's going to be next Saturday at 9 a.m. across from uh, Mike's Smokehouse, the old Mike's Smokehouse, right behind, right behind Quick Trip. Now, from what I understand, it sounds like they've had a couple of nights of vandalism here in the last week, two weeks. So uh, a couple thousand dollars in damage, a fence was torn down and stuff like that. So if you're available to come next Saturday and help out and kind of do some work, uh, through the seat to it ministry for uh, Hope Gospel. That would be greatly appreciated, so please uh, consider that. It's time for our mission moment right now. We've got a couple of special guests with us this morning. Very excited to welcome back Ben and Danielle Colbinson. 
They're here to talk a little bit about their uh, ministry. They got their, their little kids with them too. So Ben, please help me welcome Ben and Danielle. Hey guys. Morning, Calvary. Good morning. It is so good to be back. Many of you have no idea who we are, and uh, that would be expected. Sorry. Uh, this is my family. My name is Ben, my wife Danielle, our oldest son Hudson. And what's your name? This is Levi. And then we actually have another one coming in December. So we're doing a little uh, gender reveal today. So. Uh, we're pretty excited about that, but anyways, that's um, <laughs> probably enough about that. So we are with a ministry called The Navigators. I was involved with The Navigators here at UW-Eau Claire when I was a student and started coming to the old Calvary Church building in 2008, maybe, and was part of this church for five years before I left and went back, and my wife is also part of this church for a few years. And we've been on staff now with the Navigators for a few years, most recently in Madison and at Whitewater, raising up the next generation of college students who are going to become tomorrow's... Hi. <laughs> you want to say something? Who are going to be um, laborers living next to the lost, whether it's in the business world, whether it's their families. They are the, the next generation. And most... <laughs> All right. We tried. <laughs> there we go. And so we, um, we love working with college students. Re right now we move back to River Falls, are going to be starting a new navigator ministry there. And our heart is to reach students. Uh, our, our heart is to reach any student, but in particular those that are going to small towns, overlook places, or the nations. So I lo look forward to working with college kids that are from farms or going into agriculture or teachers that are going to go to a lot of these small towns around here that have no good church in that small community. And so we are, we are excited, we are nervous, frankly, too. You guys can be praying for us that we would have some mighty men and women who are strong in the Lord and want to go hard after him to help us um, reach that college campus and reach a lot of small towns in Minnesota, Wisconsin, and hopefully the world. And part of, our, part of my story coming to Christ is I came to Christ as a freshman in high school and it was some people, it was a 50 year old youth pastor who was involved with the Navigators back in the 70s and she, um, you know, I, I lived in an overlooked small town of Spring Valley. There was not much going on there kind of a thing, but God did a revival there that has now touched many, I think we counted 24 nations at least, full-time pastors and missionaries. We got, we got a lot, it's a really cool story. I'd love to share more about it sometime. But we are with the Navigators, and we are so thankful for your partnership in helping us reach these students and all these small communities in the nations. So thank you very much. Awesome. 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 So great to have you guys back. Let's pray for these guys, and let's pray for the uh, Navigators ministry. And uh, again, it's a wonderful opportunity for us to be able to, uh, to, be able to give and uh, to support a ministry like that. So. As we pray this morning, uh, the ushers will come forward and we'll prepare for our tithes and offerings as well. Let's pray for you guys. Father, thank you. Thank you so much for Ben and Danielle and their family, Lord, and uh, for the, uh, the beautiful little boys that you've given them and the one that's on, their, on the way, Lord. We thank you and we praise you, Father. Thank you for this ministry. We ask, Father, that you would continue to bless them and give them the strength to uh, boldly proclaim your name, Jesus, and that uh, students would have an open heart to know who you are and that more students would come to a personal relationship with you, Christ. Bless them in a great and mighty way in this offering this morning as well, Father, in Jesus' name, amen.
Casting down 
this soul can be redeemed. Justice, truth, and mercy. have salvation. Amen? Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Children who are in the ages of three to five can head back to our children's program that we offer during the service called Discover Link. And they're making their way out. Parents, you can escort them to the, the bright, colorful hallway. We are here this morning to wrap up our uh, kind of wrap up our summer, really. I'm surprised none of you went, oh, oh, summer is drawing near and the snow is about. Okay. Make sure you're listening. Well, we've had a great summer and uh, we worked through the book of Joshua and we saw how Joshua was able to take what the Lord had given him and put it into practice and uh, see some great courageous faith that he did and what he was able to accomplish under the power of God. And now for the last few weeks, we've been seeing what we need to do to have those same steps of faith because so often we look at Bible characters as just that, a character in a story or in a book, and that's not true. These are historical people. And they were able to do great things, and we are able to do great things from the Lord. And so that's what this series has been. We have worked through uh, what it means to study God's Word, uh, what it means to be led by the Holy Spirit, and what it means to have an active prayer life. And today we're going to see a word that we are familiar with that some of you may tune out right away, but that word is unity. What does it mean for us as the body of Christ to be united? But more importantly, what are the, what are the roots of that? Where does that unity come from? And so that's what we're going to be dealing with today. Uh, as the ushers hand out some Bibles here, I'm going to give you an update on yesterday's event that was here. So if you need a Bible, you need something to follow along with, you didn't bring one today, or you don't have a Bible at all, raise your hand nice and high. Our ushers are going to give you a Bible. If you don't have one, you can keep it. It's our gift to you. If you just need one to use today, then you can put it on the table on your way out. Keep those hands nice and high. The ushers will bring you a Bible. As that's happening, I want to update you on the event that we had yesterday called King of the Hill. We partnered with WWIB and had a cornhole tournament and a cookie sale and a whole bunch of stuff, and we raised funds for Feed My People. The reason I'm telling you this is because it fits perfectly with our theme of unity. What does it mean to be the body of Christ and to show the people around us, not just the people you're sitting next to, but the people in the world who are of the world, who need Jesus? What does it look like? And yesterday, many of you I saw uh, pop in and out to see what was going on. You were able to see a genuine 
demonstration of the love of Christ. We didn't drum this up for promotional sake. It was genuinely to help the people in our community, to love the people around us. And so we were able to, I don't know the totals yet, and we'll get you those, but we were able to raise for sure a couple thousand dollars for Feed My People. We'll get you the total numbers so you can be excited, but also know that there were people here that got to hear about Jesus, that got to meet some of you who love Jesus with all your heart, and you may have made a difference. In fact, there may be some sitting in here today, and we don't know it. Maybe we haven't been able to meet them yet. But what a great event, and I thank you for the overabundance of cookies that we had. Um, When we told WWIB that our people like to bake cookies, they never thought that you liked to bake cookies that much. I said, we do this almost for a living. We've got elections, we've got all these things. Uh, They were flooded with cookies, so thank you. That went a long way. And everyone who helped volunteer, whether it was praying, whether it was here in person, thank you. What a great event to reach into our community and to demonstrate this genuine love of Christ. And that's what we're going to talk about today. I'm going to go out on a little bit of a limb, and I'm going to tell you today that unity, the way that I'm seeing it today, as I'm going to describe it to you, is a product Sometimes we think unity is something that we put on and we force ourselves to be in unity with another person. But I'm going to tell you that I think as we've worked through God's word, being led by the spirit and prayer, that unity is actually a product that's produced from those three things being significant in our lives. What I mean by that is if you are actively studying God's word, And you are caring not only what he's teaching you about your own life, but he's revealing to you how much he loves the person next to you and the people in this world. If you are being led by the Holy Spirit to continue that heart that God has, and he, the Holy Spirit, is revealing to you how you're going to care for the people next to you, how you're going to love them, how you're going to hurt with them. If you are in prayer communicating with Almighty God in an active prayer life through Jesus Christ, then unity is just a product. It's an expression of those three things. And so often we get out of whack because we think it's something we have to do. And that's why we struggle with unity. Because under our own power, we won't be united with each other. We're not going to like the way that person talks or dresses, or the way that they execute that job, or the way that they help or don't help in that area, we will get frustrated. We will not have unity. But if we're focused on the three things that we presented in this sermon series so far, unity is kind of a natural thing because we're having a heart, the heart of God towards each other. You see, the Godhead itself are represented in those three categories. God the Father, God the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And there's no disunity in the Trinity. There is perfect communion. And so if we are seeking the Trinity, seeking who God the Father is, knowing what Jesus Christ does for us, being led by the Holy Spirit, then there can't be disunity if we're all going towards the same place. It's us that get in the way. It's our focus and our priorities. Unity takes humility. Humility is necessary anyway as we study God's word, as we're led by the Spirit, and as we pray. You can't go to God prideful, bringing something to the table and telling God, I've got this portion, I just need you for this other portion. We have to be completely humble before the Lord in all three of those categories. And unity takes humility. It involves placing others as more important than yourself. It involves loving others as Christ loves them and as Christ loves you. You see, we refocus ourselves so often when we go to prayer, when we study God's word, when we're led by the Spirit. We refocus not on us, but on God and who he made us to be and how he loves. And then suddenly, I can look around this room and I can love each and every one of you because I know that God himself does. That's what we're talking about with unity. I want to read to you two passages. One is from John chapter 13. So if you have those Bibles, you can turn to John chapter 13. Don't be afraid, like we talked about a few weeks ago. Go to the very front of your Bible. There's a whole list with page numbers that show you where the book of the Bible is. And so once you find that book, you can flip. It's, it's numerical, chapter 1. We're going all the way to chapter 13. The verses are the same. Start with verse 1 of that chapter, but we're going all the way down to uh, verse 31 
I'm going to read to you a few verses from that chapter, and then I'm going to have you flip to 1 Corinthians 13. You're welcome to stand. The reason you would is because you honor and respect God's word as the ultimate authority, and so we stand in its presence. Uh, But if you're not able to, that is okay. John chapter 13, verses 31 through 35. When he had gone out, referring to Judas, Jesus said, Now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and glorify him at once. Little children, yet a little while while I am with you, you will seek me, and just as I said to the Jews, so now I also say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another just as I have loved you. You also are to love one another by this. All people know and will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Flip over to 1 Corinthians 13. You might know this as the love chapter. But I want to read to you in a new context maybe of Jesus just telling us that we are to love and you will be known by your love. And Jesus will ultimately be known by your love. What does that love look like in relation to each other? I'm going to read the first eight verses. Don't zone out because you've heard this at a wedding so many times or maybe you have it on your bathroom wall. Listen to exactly what is being said. This is God's word. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains but have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all that I have, and if I deliver up my body to be burned but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. Love never ends. You may be seated. Those two scriptures were the ones that were laid on my heart as we talked about unity. And you, make, you might go, wait, he tricked us. This guy loves talking about love so much. I thought we were going to talk about unity. Well, the basis for why we should be united with each other comes from love. That's where it starts. God's love for each and every one of us, but our love for God to see and to care for what he cares for. And because he cares for each and every one of us, We should do the same, so it comes from love. And there's a few categories that I want to talk about with love. I want to show you the introduction of love. In your connector, you receive some notes. There's some blanks you can fill in. Anytime a word is underlined on the screen, that is a blank to fill in, and hopefully the numbers uh, match with what you have. But let's look at the introduction of love. And God's love is where we're starting. Where did God introduce love? Well, God created the heavens and the earth. This is all from Genesis chapter 1. He created the heavens and the earth. God breathed life into mankind because he loves us. God gave you breath. He didn't have to. God also recognized that we needed something. We wanted companionship, and so he gave companionship to mankind. But he didn't stop there. Not only did he breathe life into you and he gave you company and friends and a spouse and other people, he also provides for us. He gives us everything that we need. But then ultimately, we were separated from God because of sin. And God gave us a way to be redeemed. That is the love that we are talking about. And so often we look at other people and we immediately judge if we should love them based on how convenient it is for us or if it has this certain feeling. You know what I'm talking about. There are some people that you look at and you have that feeling where you go, I could love them. Let's get involved in their lives. And then there's other people that you look at and that feeling doesn't happen. In fact, the opposite happens. And you go, no, I'm just going to kind of step back. 
Today we are facing it head on. We are finding out what Scripture says, and you can't argue with Scripture. I guess you could. It would be totally pointless because it is right. And so we need to see God's love, how he breathed life into us. He created every one of us to be in harmony with each other and have companionship with each other. And he gave us a way to be redeemed. And that that redemption comes through his son, God's son. There's your next blank. God gave us his only son. This is the love that I want you to understand. You've heard this before, but ingest it. Take it seriously. What is God's love? He gave you his son, Jesus. And he did not look at us and say, clean up a little bit first. Make yourself presentable to me because I am almighty God. No. Remember last week we said, be a mess in front of God. Just be raw and genuine. Come to him and just be the mistakes that you make and admit them humbly before him. So God didn't wait for you to clean up before he gave you Jesus. He said, I'm giving you while you were still sinners. Jesus Christ died on the cross for you. That's the love that we're talking about that motivates unity. It's Jesus' love. So then Jesus came to earth and he showed us his love. He lived a perfect life because of his love for you. He did not live a perfect life for bragging rights. He didn't do it for bragging rights. He did it for sacrificial rights so that he could be your sacrifice for sin. That's the love that Jesus did. He lived a perfect life for you and for me. And then he died so that I could live. Do you see the love so often when we show other people this love that we like to show them? We wait for some sort of benefit to us or if it's convenient for us. We get a phone call, can you help with this? And we say, hold on, I've got this, all these things going on and what am I going to get out of this? Instead of going, you know what, Jesus died so that I could live. I'm going to show people the same. I'm going to do the same things out of love because that's what God would do and that's what Jesus did. That's the love that we're talking about. So that's the introduction. There's plenty more of examples throughout Scripture of where God would introduce his love to different people and show that love. But those are just some of the few. So what is the importance of love then? Why is this so important that we learn to live in unity and we show love to each other? Well, it verifies our testimony. 1 Corinthians 3, 1 and 2 says this, If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but I have not love, I'm just a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers, and I understand all mysteries and all knowledge, or if, even if I have so much faith that I can remove the mountains, but I don't have love, then I am nothing. John 13, 35, which I read, it also says this, By this all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. So what is the importance of love? It verifies our testimony. The words don't mean anything if it's not motivated by love or the heart for Christ behind it. We represent Jesus Christ. If it's only words that we're telling people, then we actually misrepresent Jesus. You can put on all the actions of what love is supposed to look like, and they can mean nothing if it's not motivated by your love for Jesus Christ. They mean nothing, and you're misrepresenting Jesus because Jesus did not come to this earth to just show us some actions of love. He came because of love. The motivation of what he did for us was love. Do we really, do we really believe the scriptures that tell us that without love, that we are nothing? Maybe you're sitting here today going, man, I have done a lot of preaching to my fellow co-workers, telling people all about this Jesus, but it comes from an obligation rather than a genuine love and concern of Jesus for these people. Do we really believe scripture that it could possibly mean nothing what we've done to this point? 
Or do you stand here today knowing that love, understanding that love and saying, no, I love people. And so we're going to put on events like King of the Hill because we want people to see the love of Christ and get them the food that they need and the help that they need. But we want to speak to them spiritually because that is what's most important. Is that what is generating all of our testimony is a love. So love is important because it verifies our testimony. But love is important because it validates our actions. I read to you these verses. Verse 3 of chapter 13 says, if I, have, if I give away all that I have and if I deliver up my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. Do you see how important love is? That the action itself doesn't really mean anything if it's not motivated and initiated by love itself. A love for God Almighty, the God who gave us his son, Jesus Christ, for saving our sins. It validates our actions. The actions, just like words, don't mean anything if love or heart is not behind them. And do we really believe scriptures in this category too where it says even if our words have all of this meaning and then maybe some of our actions have some love to them, but if it's not motivated by love, then it means nothing? Do we really believe that? And today is the day that I think we need to face reality and I need to face reality of saying, what is motivating what I do for people? What is it? Do I care genuinely because that's what I'm supposed to do? Do I care genuinely because it's a genuine love for them because I understand God created them, God created me, and we're supposed to work together in harmony. So love is important, and it's much more important than just those two points. But you have all of Scripture to look through and to understand that, and you know the importance of love. But what is the influence of love? We know now why it's important, but what happens when we start to love each other the same way that God loves us? There's an influence that happens. I mentioned it before, but the influence is that it directs people to an accurate Jesus. Us loving others the way that Jesus loves them and the way that Jesus loves us, if we do that, then we represent and we direct people to the accurate view of Jesus. And so often Christians misrepresent Jesus because we'll do this action to your face, but we only did it because it's convenient. And then we'll go home and then we'll tell our family and say, wow, that person is a mess. And suddenly, it has nothing to do with love. Why did we even do it in the first place? We misrepresented Jesus. But if we do it the way that God loves us, and we do it accurately, then we point people to an accurate view of Jesus. Because love validates our actions, and it validates our words. So we're directing people to who Jesus actually is. And so often we don't do that. And if we're direct people, people, directing people to an accurate Jesus, then we're also directing them to repentance. Because you can't have an accurate representation of Jesus without people seeing that they're sinful. And without people seeing that Jesus is the solution. That only Jesus can save. That Jesus was the perfect sacrifice. So we're directing people to repentance. And so often the world will scream and say, Christians are just mean because you're telling us that we're sinful. Yes. And I was sinful. And I still am struggling with sin. But because of my active prayer life, my being led by the Holy Spirit, my studying God's word, I know the importance and you know the importance of relating to people, of loving people, of going before the Lord humbly and say, I messed up again, but direct me down your path so that I can give the testimony of Jesus to others. So many times we misrepresent, but if we're representing the love that God has for us, that Jesus has for us, then we're showing an accurate picture of Jesus to the world. We're directing people to repentance, and ultimately that repentance produces healing produces healing. It not only produces healing in the body of Christ as there's wrongs that happen between each one of us. 
And if we're focused on Jesus and his forgiveness and his love, then those wrongs start to not matter as much as they used to because we're quick to forgive. Loving is right on the forefront of what we want to show to people. So it not only produces healing within the body of Christ, but it ultimately can produce healing to the people that need it the most, those people that don't have Jesus as their Savior. Jesus Christ provides the ultimate healing and really the only healing that is truly necessary, and that's one for the soul. That's what our love can do. Not our love that we produce, but the love that we can show that comes from Jesus Christ. It can produce healing, but it also can produce harmony. We talked a few weeks ago when there was a united group of believers that were worshiping Christ, not only in this place, but out at One Fest. We talked about the importance of harmony. And that's available on the website if you missed that week. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time there, but the importance of harmony. We love one another and it produces healing and it can produce harmony between us. But it also produces honor. 1 Corinthians 12, 26 says, If one member is honored, then we all rejoice together. How good does it feel to be honored? How good does it feel to receive a compliment from someone? Not to build up our pride, but for encouragement. We all want to be encouraged. And that won't happen if we're not focused on loving each other. If those words of encouragement just come because it's some checklist this week, I need to do better at encouraging, so I have a list that tells me and reminds me to encourage. That's the wrong motivation. Encouraging each other should come from the depth of our soul because we are deep in God's word and we understand who God is through prayer and a relationship with Jesus Christ and we're being led by the Holy Spirit so when we look around we can go, I love people so much that that person needs encouragement this morning. And I'm doing it not because it's on a list or not even because it's a command, but because I desire to love the way that God loves me. We produce honor with the love of God being shown to other people. So that's what love kind of looks like around us. But what does the involvement of love look like? How does our love involve other people? What does love's involvement look like? 1 Corinthians 12, 26, so right before the love chapter, I just read part of it, but let me read to you the whole thing. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. Some of you have heard that verse before, and you go, oh, I know that one. I'm going to read it one more time because this is the truth of God's word, and this is how the functioning body of Christ is supposed to look. If one member suffers, all suffer together. It's not just a quick shout up or prayer request because that person is hurting, so I'll pray for them. That may be a good start, but this, if one member suffers, Do you suffer with them? Are you heartbroken when someone is heartbroken? And if not, it's not something that you can just put on to improve yourself and be better in that area. No, it comes as a product of knowing God himself better. And we do that through his word. We do that through prayer. We do that through being led by the Holy Spirit. And so it doesn't depend on how much I can do. It's a reflection sometimes of how close you are with God himself through Jesus Christ. Do you suffer when someone suffers? I was going to wait until our Selah time after the sermon, but it fits right here. One of the things you might know about me is when I get kind of tired... I cry really quickly. Um, But I'm a crier. I like to cry too, so it's fun. Patty, thank you last week for the tissue at the front of the stage. It was very nice. She's prepared every week for me to cry. (laughs) Do we suffer when someone else suffers? We had news this week from my sister's church down in Sun Prairie that one of their pastors who um, has a, I believe she's six years old, is that correct? Seven. Seven years old. 
Her name is Eva. She had an accident this week. Uh, my, my niece, Kylie, babysits for Eva every week. And um, Eva had an accident this week. Just a small fall. But it caused some serious, serious damage. She had to be rushed to the emergency room right away. She had so much pressure in her brain from bleeding that they had to make, take immediate action. And the only word that we had initially from this pastor through Facebook was that the next 72 hours will be critical to her recovery. They still don't know exactly what's going to happen. She could be left with permanent brain damage. She could, by the miracle and grace of God, be healed and be the normal little Eva that we or they knew before. But the reason I'm sharing to you to this, or this to you is because so often we'll present a request and while we do a great job of setting time aside to pray, and I know some of you have already written her name down on your prayer list, and that's wonderful, but when you lift her up in prayer, are you suffering like that family is suffering? Where these parents have a seven-year-old daughter that life just suddenly changed. Are you putting yourself in their shoes and saying, if that was me, I would be heartbroken? Or do we just throw up a request to God and trust that he's got it? Because that is a part, to trust that God has it. But do you suffer when one member suffers? Do you also honor and rejoice with people when they are honored? Or do we sit back and we go, oh, they get recognition, but I don't. Well, how come that person at my job got a pay raise and I didn't? I work harder than that. Hold on. Are we rejoicing with each other just like you would want someone to rejoice with you? Or do we dismiss that verse? And we think that's for some of those really religious people. This is for all of us. Because all of us can know Jesus Christ and we can know the heart of God for each other. And so what does love's involvement look like? We care. We show concern. We hurt for each other. But we also celebrate with and then we forgive each other quickly. If everything else was stripped away and your relationship with the Lord was evaluated by only that little place in your heart that generates your actions and your words, if that was the only thing that was evaluated, your love for others, how are you doing? Or have we just put on a show with a lot of words that we love. Or maybe we've only put on a show of a lot of actions. But that place in our heart doesn't motivate us to love because that love isn't there. If we have Jesus Christ and we know his love or we say we do, what is motivating that love? Love's involvement shows care, concern, love, and celebration with people. So many things that cause disunity in the body of Christ only matter on earth. Which means they don't ultimately matter. Some of the lists that I gave you before, before, well, I don't like the way that person does that, and I don't appreciate the way that they dress, or I don't like the way that they talk. You realize none of that matters eternally. None of it. Yes, we need to grow more and more like Christ and work on character issues and our love for God and hold each other accountable in that way. But all of the things that so often get in the way of the body of Christ's unity don't matter. It only matters on earth. We stood here in this place this morning and we sang, Holy, Holy, Holy. Do you realize that someday all believers will gather together and nothing else matters except us singing, Holy, Holy, Holy to God himself. How much time is wasted on the things that don't matter? How much time is spent in the name of love when it's not really in the name of love at all? It's love for self and not for God. One day we will all gather together and sing holy, holy, holy. And not, not all of the things that we see in the church are bad news because there are plenty of people in this place that love genuinely. I've been making a list over the summer, and this is just a very brief list of all the things that I'm just so impressed by 
that I had no idea were happening in this church. Because people that do them are not self-promoting. They don't call the office and say, by the way, I went to this person's house this week. They don't do that because it's genuinely motivated by love and concern and it doesn't need recognition. So I've been making a list. I'm not going to share exact names and if this is someone in here, well it is someone in here, if you're here today and you recognize that you're doing that, be encouraged. Do you realize that we have people in this church that it's not an organized ministry but they every month they volunteer, maybe even more than that, to go clean some of the elderly people's houses in this place. People that can't do it on their own. I found that out. I had no idea that that's been happening for a long, long time. It's not the church standing up here from the front going, we need someone to clean. It's the love of Jesus Christ fleshing itself out going, I wonder if that person needs help and I'm going to do something about it. That's happening. You know that meals are happening when we ask you to help make meals that we can put in the freezer for when people have emergencies or surgery or if they have babies. It's just so nice to bless people. But did you know that it's going above and beyond that? That meals are happening without a ministry needing it to happen? That people recognize and drop off, you know what? I noticed that you've just been busy with life. Here's a meal. Here's a gift card to a restaurant. Because it's sometimes nice to just have the convenience of a meal dropped off. That's happening. We have people who have made it their mission that when they hear of someone in the hospital, they go visit. And I'm not just talking about Pastor Fred and Sandy. They do that because they love people, not because they're on staff, but we have other people that do the same thing. They hear about a need, someone had surgery, someone's in the hospital for whatever. We have people in this building that go do that regularly because they love. We have people that drive people to doctor appointments, that give rides to the airport, that spend a lot of their time in visitation with others. We have people in this church that every time there's anything possible that needs a card written, whether it's an I'm sorry card, a sympathy card, an encouragement card, a get well soon card, a thank you card, we have people in this church that are immediate at mailing it out the next day because they love. So when we look around at the involvement of love and what does it look like, yes, it does involve suffering with other, when others suffer. But it also looks like this. It looks like some of you, many of you, who are loving each other genuinely from the depths of your soul. But what does love's involvement feel like? We know what it looks like, but now get really personal and think about the time in your life where you just felt that warm coziness of love. What does it feel like? 1 Corinthians 13, 7 tells us it bears all things, it believes all things, it hopes all things, and it endures all things. Do we really know what those four things look like? What would it look like in a relationship with someone else if you knew that they would bear with you in everything? In everything. If you came to someone genuinely and you expressed the depth of your misery that you're in, and they looked at you and they said, I'm with you. I hurt with you. I will bear with you in all things. What would it look like in the body of Christ if we believed in all things with each other? That we hoped with people. We hoped in every situation because our hope is in the Lord and not in the circumstance. What if we as a group of believers said that we will endure everything together because of love. We would start showing thankfulness that we have each other. So often it is so easy to complain, to complain about something that we don't like with another person, but if we are focused on the love of God through Jesus Christ, then we can actually be thankful for each other. We don't just have to put up with people But it also means we wouldn't just ignore the problems. It would mean that the basis for everything that we do and say is motivated by our love for them. So if I have to correct you, it's because I love you. And if I have to ignore something that you're doing that drives me crazy, I'm not doing it just to get by. I'm doing it because I love you. 
That's what it feels like. That we could be thankful for each other. We would give others the benefit of the doubt. So many times we get stuck in that person has wronged me so many times. I'm, I'm done. But love gives us a fresh benefit of the doubt every time. And now we hope in them and we trust in them because we love them and we're treating them the way that God treats us when we mess up. So often we trip and fall constantly. And not once ever has God said, I am so tired of you. I am so done with you. I'm giving up. I can't take it anymore. No, God says, grab my hand. I'm still here. And I always will be. That's what love feels like. We would begin to love without end. Now, sometimes there's boundaries that have to get set up in a loving relationship. But boundaries doesn't mean an end to the love that we feel for that person. When we get frustrated with people, frustration doesn't mean an end to the love that we feel and show people. And even wrongdoing, when someone wrongs us or someone hurts us, it doesn't mean an end to the love that we show to them. Because the love doesn't come from my preference. It doesn't come from my comfort. It comes from God himself. And as I know his love for me better, I know his love for you better. And there's never an end to God's love. I want to close with you feeling something from Scripture that hopefully touches your heart. As we think about loving each other, I want you to remember, just individually, remember the feeling, if you are a believer in Jesus, remember the feeling of how God treated you out of his love when you were a sinner. When you recognized that you could bring nothing to Almighty God and you needed Jesus Christ. And all of us are in that same boat together. We were at one point. Remember the feeling of when you got to stand before God and go, I am broken. I am a mess. Give me Jesus. What is the inspiration of love? Your last break. And I want to read to you Psalm 103 as we close. So many times, like I've said so many times, we hear the same scripture. Sometimes it loses its meaning or we don't apply it the way that we should. But I want you to hear what love feels like. I want you to focus on when you are in the worst situation that you've ever been in. What would it feel like to have someone come to you and wrap their arms around you and say, let's do this together because I love you and I hurt with you and I feel what you're feeling and I want to care for you. That's what God himself does for us. Psalm 103, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits who forgives all of your iniquity, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life out of the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy, who satisfies you with good so that your your youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord's work is... The Lord works righteousness and justice for all who are oppressed. He made known his ways to Moses, his acts to the people of Israel. The Lord is merciful and he's gracious. He's slow to anger and he's abounding in steadfast love. He will not always chide nor will he keep his anger forever. He does not deal with us according to our sins. Amen. Nor repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love towards those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. As a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. For he knows our frame. He remembers that we are dust. 
As for man, his days are like grass. He flourishes like a flower of the field. For the wind passes over it, and it is gone, and its place knows it no more. But the steadfast love of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear him. And his righteousness to his children's children, to those who keep his covenant and remember to do his commandments. The Lord has established his throne in the heavens, and his kingdom rules over all. Bless the Lord, O oh, you, his angels, you mighty ones who do his word, obeying the voice of his word. Bless the Lord, all his hosts, his ministers who do his will. Bless the Lord, all his work in all places of his dominion. Bless the Lord, O oh, my soul. Let's pray. Father, there are no words that can come from my mouth that can accurately show us the depth of your love. Father, your love has so many examples in Scripture. It has so much depth of what it means and how it feels and what you do to show us your love. In this place, Lord, I thank you for the people that know your love, that flesh out your love because they're motivated by an understanding of what your love truly means. I thank you for the people in here this morning who have recognized that maybe their love has just been a show of words or a show of actions. And they are prepared this day to dive deeper into your word, to know you better and to know more of your love. They are prepared today to make a commitment to trust in the Holy Spirit and his leading to a more active prayer life through Jesus Christ, that they will know what that love looks like and a product of that will be unity with each other. But Father, I pray for the people in this place who don't know this love that I'm talking about. There may be people in this place who have looked for love in so many different places and they've always come up short. Because there is no genuine, true love outside of Jesus Christ. And so, Father, for those people this morning, I pray that the next few moments of prayer, you would speak to their heart. You would tug on their heart. You would squeeze their heart if they needed a little bit more violently to wake up and see that love can only come from a God who is love, from a God who gave his son Jesus so that we could be forgiven, from a Jesus, a Savior, who lived a perfect life so that I could live, but he had to die. Father, thank you so much this morning and for my life, for not dealing with me according to my transgressions. And the amount of love that you show in every second of every day for a broken vessel. I thank you for how you've blessed me. For how you restore me from the pit. How your arm is right there to lift me up. And how you are the same God and the same love applies to all of the people in this room. And all of the people around the world. Would you penetrate our heart today to show that love through unity to other people. Amen. I want to give you an opportunity over the next few moments to have a time of Selah, which is our time of prayer, that we go before the Lord and we, we digest what we've learned. Maybe you've been able to digest it and you're ready to put it into action. Maybe there's someone in this room that you've hurt or that you've been hurt by. And today, you're not going to let time pass anymore. You're not going to let discomfort be the ruler. You're not going to let fear overpower. You're going to let love conquer today. And you're going to go to them. Or maybe you're going to pray for someone that you're suffering with today. Maybe you'll take this time to pray for Eva and her family and what they're going through. Would you take this opportunity 
You can break into groups if you'd like. You can stay as an individual if you'd like. There is no script for the next few moments. Would you allow your love and your understanding of God's love to just penetrate these next few moment, moments? And could we just be united in our love for Jesus Christ? together walking in the spirit there's much to be done we will come reach out from our comforts so they will know you by our love sisters we were made for kindness we can pierce the darkness as he shines through us we will come reaching with the song of healing and they will know us by our love the time is for justice stem firm in the truth and now set your hearts above we will be reaching long after they're gone and they will know us by our love the time is now come church said before that they will know us by our love, but Lord, we are prepared today to truly understand what that means and to put it into practice. Let us love as you love. Let our hands be your hands. Let the words that we say be motivated by a love for you, Father. The time is now. We know that time is running out, that your return draws closer and closer every day, Jesus. And for that we are excited, but at the same time we are heartbroken 
for the people that need Jesus Christ. And so today is the day for us to do something about it, to have a heart for the lost, to spread the gospel message of Jesus Christ to them, to encourage each other in the body of Christ and to be united and to focus on the things that are eternal, not the things that only matter here on earth, which don't ultimately matter. Father, would the love of Jesus Christ penetrate our hearts today. We begin to be motivated in our actions and our words by that love. And may there be great unity in this place, not for the sake of this place, but for the sake of your kingdom and the message of Jesus Christ. We pray this in his name. Amen. I kind of want to sing holy, holy, holy. Can we do that before we're dismissed? I want you to answer that. Do you want to do that? Let's do that. Holy, holy, holy.